welcome to another episode of the Super Critical Podcast, where we delve into the fun and oftentimes nonsensical way pop culture portrays nuclear weapons. My name is Tib Westmeyer, someone who studies nuclear weapons and works on nuclear security for a living. Gabe is not able to join us on the podcast today because he is busy putting the second coat of wax on his DeLorean. But luckily, I am joined today by our friend Kevin. Hey, everybody. This is Kevin. Kevin, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, longtime listeners will remember Kevin as our friend that was briefly on our podcast episode about the nuclear war card game. And I uh, say briefly because he was the first player to be eliminated. So today you get to redeem yourself on the podcast here. Yes, I uh, hope to last longer this time around. <laughs> Ooh. In addition to Kevin being a prior guest of the podcast, Kevin was actually the one who gave me my podcast equipment. Uh, I guess you had a, a banjo career that you were trying to get started and then maybe paused on that for a while. And you gave me my podcast uh, microphones and my original mixer. This was an idea of doing this podcast, but Kevin was the one that physically made it happen. So very much appreciate that. It, it, my, my failed music career only sprouts uh, seeds of podcastery on the outside. So, you know, happy to help. Well, if you want to do a banjo remix of our uh, podcast theme, I would be very appreciative in the future <laughs> at some point. Oh. In this episode, we continue our mini nuke series. We save these special episodes for when there's a slice of pop culture uh, with some nuclear elements, but not the entire thing is radioactive. Not every episode can be three hours long. No one's got time for that, even if you have a time machine. A smooth and completely subtle transition to our topic of the podcast episode today, the Back to the Future movie series and its surprising amount of nuclear plot content, both what ended up on the screen and even more that was cut and used for another movie that we covered on the podcast, but more on that later. Kevin, how would you describe the general outline of the Back to the Future trilogy? Uh, well, Tim, if I were to just sum that up into a nice, tidy uh, statement, I would say Back to the Future as a series is a, about an interesting relationship between a boy and his doc who gets a series of adventures and mishaps over the course of 130 years. It's, it's quite a, an expansive series uh, that we get involved here, and we're going to focus mostly today on Back to the Future 1, uh, but we know there'll be a little bit of, of sprinkling of Back to the Future 2 and 3, uh, but most of the new content is, is firmly established in the first film. This movie, I'm glad that you and I not only can cover it, but to cover it together, because we, in our own individual lives, have a pretty strong connection to this film. Um, but also, together, we had a little special moment. I remember as a kid, I actually sat in the original Back to the Future A car uh, in, at Universal Studios Hollywood when I was in maybe like sixth or seventh grade, maybe even younger than that, uh, on a tour, because I lived in Southern California. We went on a tour for school, that was our field trip, and got to sit in the car, uh, in, in the 90s, we got to participate in this amazing 3D ride where you sit in a DeLorean, kind of like Star Tours, but you sit in a DeLorean and, and dock around, the remote pilots you around, and it shakes and moves around. Uh, you're chasing after Biff because he stole another time machine. Very, very cool stuff, uh, but also I got to participate in a, an interactive, like, here's how movies are made scene, where it was the Back to the Future clock tower scene. And I didn't get to participate as Doc Brown or Marty. That was my friend Bobby that got to do Doc Brown. But I was the guy shaking a piece of metal to make sounds like thunder. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. So this movie, in addition to being great, and I it saw it at the perfect time in my life, it has a, a strong connection for me. Um, so I'm happy that we were able to cover it. And ha I'm happy that it has new things to talk about. Uh, but what about you, Kevin? Well, uh, it's, it's funny you talk about the... Uh the ACAR at Universal Studios Hollywood because my father actually got to uh, see that same exact car when my father was traveling to California to help with the 1994 Northridge earthquake near mm. L.A. So I have a picture of him next to the same car and also of the Backlot Tour that included uh, some other favorites such as the Back to the Future 3 time machine and also the A-Team van, mm. which is a classic. Were you jealous uh, as a kid? I, I mean, admittedly, A Team I didn't really learn about until a little bit later. But uh, you know, the back of the I, I really wished I could have been there. You know, minus all of the uh, destruction of the earthquake, sure, uh, which I'm sure you were far more familiar with than I am, having grown up in uh, Pennsylvania. So, well, most people in the Cold War had their drop and cover drills. We had the uh, earthquake drills. 
A little, yeah. little less of a, a concern, but certainly something that you grew up with. Well, a- interestingly, and in a total aside, I got to experience exactly one earthquake growing up as a child. Uh, I was sitting on the ground getting ready for cross-country practice, and the earth started to move in a way that I had never experienced before, <laughs> and I just had absolutely no idea what was going on. So you would have been all like, ah, it's just another earthquake. And I was like, that seems weird. Maybe in my teenage years, my early teenage years, I am just uh, going through changes and uh, the, the body and the world just grumbles from time to time. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. It sounds heavy. Yeah. Uh, but no, otherwise, I've been interested in Back to the Future since the eh, probably early 90s, you know, and that's, that kind of led to my lifelong interest in the the DeLorean and so just all of that has has just kind of grown over the years well just so it's on the podcast table here you're a big motorcycle and car guy uh yes. you you on a number of occasions have helped me fix my car you're known in our group here as the the guy who knows uh cars historic historic cars and and current you know how they work and all that so that I'm sure this was a treat to you to to really delve into the DeLorean and how, and how it operates and, and how you can make it into a time machine. Absolutely. Uh, and then Kevin and I also, uh, we got together on a very special day on October 21st, 2015, uh, which is known as Back to the Future Day. This is the day that Marty McFly travels from 1985 uh, into the future, which is now in 2018, the past. I was always excited as a kid for this day to come. Uh, You know, I was never expecting flying cars, but it was always kind of fun to eventually be that day. I remember on Facebook, there were every other year, there was some kind of hoax. Oh, today's Back to the Future Day. And they would have a fake uh, DeLorean uh, time Time circuits. circuits, And it would say that day. My sister fell for that probably three times. And each time I had to write back to her on Facebook, no, the exact date (laughs) is October 21st, 2015. It's on my calendar. Uh, I know when it's going to be. And Kevin and I got together and we were what? One of... Ten people in the theater? It was not a well, uh, well-tended show, but... Uh, we sat and watched all three of them that evening. I think we took half the day off yes. and watched them, but that was a lot of fun. And who knows, back then, three years ago, we would have been sitting here talking about the nuke-related content yes. of Back to the Future. But we weren't the only ones. A lot of other people really liked this movie. Uh, according to a documentary that we watched, uh, <laughs> Princess Diana and Prince Charles, they attended the premiere of the movie... Very interesting that they attended the premiere of this film as opposed to any other film uh, that would have come out that year. But uh, she really loved the scene where uh, the manure falls on uh, Biff Tannen. Apparently that was her favorite little little joke there. Uh, Ronald Reagan really liked the movie. Uh, you know, we, we heard a lot about how he really liked the TV movie The Day After about a nuclear attack that happens in Kansas. Uh, it scared him into wanting to do more on nuclear disarmament. Uh, but he loved Back to the Future so much, he asked the projectionist to replay the joke that he was going to, you know, who in 1955, Doc asked, who's the president in 1980s? And they go, Ronald Reagan. And he goes, the, I, the actor? Uh, he loved that joke so much that he asked him to play it a couple times. And he, he quoted the movie in his 1986 State of the Union. So really, this film has quite a cultural connection to people. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes gives the first one a 96% rating. Uh, the second movie of the series at 63% uh, score, and the third movie gets 74%, uh, which always surprises me because Back to the Future 2, Kevin, I don't know if this is the, your way too, but was always my favorite growing up. So to see these reviews now as an adult, uh, I don't really understand it. You know, Tim, I really, I really don't understand how people could be so super critical about uh, Back to the Future <laughs> 2 when really it had so much going on for it. And I, I would agree and certainly argue that Back to the Future 2 is also my favorite. Yep. Maybe it's not the best movie, but it's certainly not as bad as the reviews, uh, contemporary reviews at least, have put it there. But we're not here just to, to gush about how much we liked our, our childhood watching Back to the Future, right? We're here to, to run through the plot, talk about the nuclear-related content because – like the movie Jaws, which also has that connection with Steven Spielberg, who was an executive producer on this movie. Robert Zemeckis directed it. Bob Gale helped to write it. That whole team, they worked together on a lot of different times and places. But, you know, like Jaws, when you would think, oh, Jaws is about a shark, right? Well, yeah, there's also some new content, which we covered in one of our episodes, because uh, the whole monologue that Robert Shaw gives about being on the USS Indianapolis, which brought the parts to the Hiroshima bomb site, you know, that whole story is a real, you know, real story. So we talked about it on the podcast, you know, that connection here to Back to the Future, you know, 
Back to the Future has a surprising amount of nuclear content, both on screen as well as stuff that was cut from previous drafts. So I'm always surprised by the amount of nuclear content in this, too. I mean, admittedly, the car is really what uh, <laughs> drove my fascination, but... Uh... The, the nuclear stuff was always very interesting, too. And I, I swear, after all of these years of watching it, I still find something new every single time I see it. So We did when we watched it a few minutes ago, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so let's get through that here. Uh, again, we're going to mostly focus on the first movie, um, but we'll have a couple elements of the second and third films. But hey, if you haven't seen Back to the Future and you want to see it unspoiled, now is the time to do that. Pause the podcast. Uh, go watch the film. And then come back here, because, you know, spoiler alert, we are going to get into the details here. That's so the only way to, to really talk about it. Movie starts with a bunch of t- clocks ticking off, right? Uh, I know you have really recently got into clock making and clock repair. So maybe this was this scene a, a very, now as, as an adult, a very comforting scene for you, because you just hear all these clocks <laughs> going off here. Or did it make you anxious that now you have to repair all of them? Well, I mean... It- And who knows, maybe this scene is part of what has led to and fostered my interest in clocks because, uh, you know, I've I've had that that image in my head for all of these years, but uh, it it seems a natural progression, you know, my interest in cars and motorcycles, things mechanical, fixing things, that uh, clocks are just uh, fun little mechanical devices, but... uh, yeah, opening on all of these clocks, the tick-tock, the, the very mechanical sound, mm-hmm. it's, it's very satisfying. Now, I looked very closely. Uh, you, we saw a lot of old uh, anniversary clocks, like German anniversary clocks. We saw all these. You know, I love that when you were pointing out what the different clocks were. Uh, I didn't see a doomsday clock, right? I didn't yeah. see the, the doomsday clock that counts to midnight, which is supposed to be the end of the world. You know, there's a clock by the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. I didn't see that there. I thought that might have been a little bit too on the nose. But it wouldn't surprise me if I would have seen some sort of doomsday clock-like image there. Maybe it's there and I just missed it because this, this movie is very deep. Yeah, it's, it's full of Easter eggs, I feel. So, I mean, you see something different each time. Well, well almost immediately uh, once the film starts, there's this TV news anchor who's reporting uh, some political news or something. And then she turns and she has this news report about a theft of plutonium. In other news... Officials at the Pacific Nuclear Research Facility have denied the rumor that a case of missing plutonium was in fact stolen from their vault two weeks ago. A Libyan terrorist group had claimed responsibility for the alleged theft. However, officials now attribute the discrepancy to a simple clerical error. The FBI was still investigating the matter as no comment. This was really interesting because I wasn't sure what they were trying to draw on. There's a it's research center, a national lab called the Pacific Northwest, National Laboratory, which is based near Richland, Washington. There's also Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in Livermore, California. Um, I really wasn't sure which of those maybe it was referring to. I I think in an original draft, it was supposed to be the San Onofre nuclear power plant that they get the plutonium from. Uh, So it's somewhere where plutonium is being stored and it gets stolen by somebody. But I'll just note, I really uh, went to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, I think it took 2016, and toured there, they have a they have the world's like most powerful at the time supercomputer, which was really cool because that's what they use to simulate nuclear testing. The United States doesn't do nuclear testing, and now it's, that's what the North Koreans do. I guess not anymore now that they've destroyed their test site. Whoops. Yeah, that's where they, the United States stores a lot of their testing data on uh, hard drives, similar to the scenes you would have seen in Rogue One when they're pulling all the hard drives out. Those things, same system, is what this facility in Lawrence Livermore. Uh, uses to store all the testing data. I remember when I was walking through there, someone pointed out and said, yep, that's uh, the Trinity nuclear test data right there. And it was the one at the far end. Hmm. I asked to touch it, and they said no. Preservation first. Exactly. But this Libyan terrorist group that claims credit for it, I thought that was kind of interesting. Why would they admit to this when they haven't done whatever they're going to do with the plutonium? seems like you steal something, and then you do do the whatever nefarious thing you're going to do with it. You don't draw attention to yourself until it's too late. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe it's the kind of keep your enemy on their toes sort of situation. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're coming for you, so don't don't close your eyes, don't don't fall asleep. We'll uh, be there. Uh, sneaky. But uh, you you uh, told me about a, a little trip you made as well. Oh you yeah, ran past a, a national lab. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I did not again did not grow up on the West Coast, so I did not have uh, Piano Nell or uh, Lawrence Livermore to go. Uh, to go visit, but um, I, I did go on a motorcycle trip down through Tennessee uh, one time and got to ride right past Oak Ridge National Laboratory, mm. which uh, was basically founded during the Manhattan Project. So it was very interesting to get to go 
and uh, very, very indirectly experience that area. And it's very green. It's kind of out there and uh yeah i could i could see why they might be doing those sorts of nuclear projects <laughs> in a place like that admittedly uh it's not quite as fancy as uh, as those west coast national laboratories <laughs> maybe i don't know but they do have at least the number five fastest supercomputer perhaps in the world according to wikipedia so eh, i mean it's not it's not bad it's not bad yeah so when you were driving past oak ridge did you see any uh libyans and vw vans you know driving not, past you? no not a lot of uh not a lot of old volkswagen vans or uh nefarious characters wandering around in hmm. in, in the foothills of tennessee or what have you but uh yeah it was very interesting and a beautiful area for motorcycle riding if you're ever interested in going there oh ah, okay well that's a good recommendation so not to derail this uh, episode uh, already um but you know I, I i always thought it was interesting the idea of how easy it was for somebody maybe the libyans maybe somebody to steal the plutonium uh, but it always it reminds me of this concept this uh called nuclear material control and accountancy or which is abbreviated in in the lexicon as mcna and these are programs that help you know how much material you have of a nuclear variety at, at a facility you know, where it is and lets you know, because you have a system in place, when some of it goes missing. Because I know they mention, oh, it's a clerical error, and that's the reason why the plutonium is missing. That's the cover-up story, right? And this is a really serious question. It's, it's, it's passed off in the movie as a joke, but there are a number of things that facilities have to do to make sure that they know where all the material is. When, when some of it goes missing, they help to be able to figure out, you know, what's missing, who may have taken it. Um, there's a lot of you know big things that you do in this concept of nuclear security, which because you don't want bad actors to get access to it, and this is especially a problem, you know, not just from Libyans from the outside breaking in. You know, you imagine pulling on uh, like a ski mask and cutting some wire and breaking into a facility, but really what you have to worry about are people that work at the facility that have been either radicalized or they may have have some of their family kidnapped and now they're being leveraged against or maybe they have bad debts or any number of, of things and they need to you know make quick money so they steal some material so you have to worry about insider threat to these facilities a lot of rules have been placed internationally you know UN Security Council resolution 1540 which was uh, passed in 2004 it urged all states to quote develop and maintain appropriate physical protection measures as well as measures to account for and secure nuclear materials in the production, use, and storage and transport of nuclear material. There are a lot of different things you can do. You have to make sure you, you clearly train your staff in terms of what types of things they should do. You have to have a measurement system. You have to have the right equipment to measure even down to the smallest gram of nuclear material, you know, different isotopes, be able to do an inventory clearly to find what staff has access to this stuff you have to have radiation monitoring portals better guns guards and gates all that kind of good stuff apparently was not in place at the pacific what is it the pacific nuclear research facility in california was lacking all of these things but i guess if you didn't have some good mcna you wouldn't have had this movie right yeah yep. and the three g's yep gotta have those when we see the plutonium box and it's foreshadowed by marty's skateboard which he just kind of kicks to the side and it ends up hitting this box of plutonium. And I love this box. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. Um, but in this scene, there's so much nuke stuff that's on the subtle element of this film. Right? We see this big scene. You want to describe it with Marty and the loudspeakers? It's like we first get introduced to Marty. How can one describe it? It is a wall-sized <laughs> electric guitar amplifier. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it takes a key to uh, to engage, to power on, because, you know, something with that kind of power, you, you know. But, uh, yeah. I'm surprised it wasn't needing two keys to turn at the exact <laughs> same time, like a, right. like a two-man rule. But to see a giant person-sized woofer on this huge setup, and, of course, naturally, what is one... Uh, what is a teenager in the 1980s to do except plug in an electric guitar with the shine off the edge of your metal guitar pick <laughs> and take uh, pick to string and explode the entire speaker. Shoots, shoots Marty like 30 feet back. Uh, <laughs> knocks, that's... Off of, knocks him off his feet. <laughs> Uh, but one of the first things you see is when he turns the key, there's a little red like label, like a label maker la label that says CRM114. 
And it doesn't, you know, you look at it and you would say, well, what does this mean? I don't know. Uh, but this is a fun reference to Dr. Strangelove. You know, the, the classic Kubrick movie uh, about a, a, a bomber that is being recalled, thinks it's time for to fight nuclear World War III, but they can't recall it, so it starts a, a war. Um, CRM-114 is a reference to that, the CRM-114 discriminator, which was a fictional device on the radio panel of that B-52 that stopped them from being able to hear the recall code. Major Khan. I know you think this is crazy, but I just got a message from base over the CRM-114. He called his wing attack plan R. Did you say wing attack plan R? Well, I've been to one world fair, a picnic, and a rodeo, and that's the stupidest thing I ever heard come over a set of earphones. Well, boys, I reckon this is it. Nuclear combat toe-to-toe with the Ruskies. Apparently, this is one of uh, the director and, and as well as Bob Gale's uh, favorite movies, CRM One One Four. I did not notice that until I started doing research for this episode. Hmm. So, just one more, one of the many. If you want to take a, a drink or a shot every time <laughs> there's some sort of subtle nuclear thing, you might um, not be able to turn the podcast off because you'll be passed out on the ground. Uh, but that's just one of the one of the things here. Um, but that's that's the end of that scene. You know, Marty realizes because all the clocks go off and they're later than he imagines they're supposed to be. That he's late for school, right? So he has to, to get on his skateboard and, and head over to school. You know, it really does make one wonder, what exactly was Doc Brown testing that all of his clocks that were ringing 8 o'clock simultaneously were actually exactly 25 minutes slow? Mm-hmm. But, you know, maybe that's a, a question for another time. Well, who knows? Who knows what's going on in Doc Brown's head? Uh, Marty's late for school. He gets caught by the principal when him and his girlfriend, not the principal's girlfriend, but Marty's, uh, girlfriend Jennifer, uh, they both get caught being tardy. Uh, Principal Strickland, who is one of my favorite characters in this whole series, he calls Marty's dad a slacker, and he says, you don't want to be like your dad, who's a slacker. You've got a real attitude problem, McFly, you're a slacker. Uh, he, he mocks Marty's father as kind of being a, someone without a spine, right? Someone without any sort of gumption. You might say he's yellow. Mm, but... uh, hopefully you don't see that around him. Um, Marty is really excited about one thing, right? He wants to be able to play at the big school dance. He, he's in a rock band. You know, we don't we never meet his fellow mu- musicians in his band, but the whatever committee it was, right? They don't let him yeah, be dance. in the band. Yeah. And I mean, you know, again, what uh, what mid '80s teenager wouldn't want to be in a band that uh, that wants to make it big, that wants to get out there and <laughs> tour the tour the country, tour the world, playing the rock music. Yep, and you got to start somewhere. You have to start at your high school dance. Uh, but we learn a little bit of things once uh, Marty goes back home that his family is kind of lame, right? His mother is a functioning alcoholic who, who doesn't really like the fact that Marty dates or doesn't like when women approach men, you know, in terms of dating and asking, asking people out. Uh, he, his father, played by Kristen Glover, uh, is kind of a slacker, as we, as we heard earlier. He's risk-adverse. Kind of a, a chump who gets pushed around by Biff Tannen, who apparently is his supervisor. So we don't. That's who we meet. And this guy is, you know, he's a bully. He crashes the family car, but you know, makes his dad do all of his work, work, and and, and mocks his dad for not having the right beer at home. And when he comes home after crashing his car, uh, and his brother and sister are both kind of weird and very, very, very eighties. One of them works at a a Burger King, and the other one we don't know what they do. But the older siblings are still living at home, which is interesting but hey you know that's not so dissimilar from you know these days and millennials so hey you know some things come full circle tim mm-hmm. yeah it's a timeless huh um so we find out that marty's mom lorraine you know she f- very sadly remembers what it was like at the 1955 enchantment under the sea dance and that's when she first meets george mcfly he kisses her and then she realizes with a very sad face that this was the day that they were going to spend the rest of their lives together and she apparently isn't really happy. And yeah, very, very forlorn, drawn-out stare, kind of the sense that she was wishing things had been different. Mm-hmm. But that was a big deal that night, too, because it was a big thunderstorm. The clock tower got struck uh, that's in the town square. And that's the, the, all, the, all this information is what you're going to need to know later on uh, when we get to the big final finale stuff. But that's not before we get to our big time travel scene, right? This movie's about time travel. 
Uh, why don't you set us up here a little bit about, you know, what where does this time travel thing take place when we first meet Doc Brown and, and the famed DeLorean? Well, uh, Marty uh, wakes up late at night uh, to a... Uh, to a call from Doc Brown, who is requesting that Marty bring his JVC Handycam to come <laughs> record some mysterious event that will be taking place at the Twin Pines Mall. And uh, so Marty swings by this dark parking lamp lit mall that um, he's really not sure what's going on. So uh, then he sees a truck and he sees Doc's, trust- <laughs> Doc's <laughs> trusty dog, Einstein, waiting next to this uh, this large truck with Doc nowhere to be seen. Mm-hmm. And then cue the, uh, cue the smoke, cue the sounds of an uh, engine starting and the uh, time machine backing almost ominously out of this truck in the middle of the uh, mall parking lot. I love the sound effects. The, 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 the sound of the engine coming down, the, the smoke. Again, where's the smoke coming from? Right. But there's lots of smoke. It's very cool. It is. It it really really sets the stage for the mysterious, uh, mysterious Doc Brown and the mysterious machine that he has built. But we learn a little bit about Doc Brown's politics here, because again, uh, time to take a shot. Another tiny little random uh, subtle nuke thing. He has a bumper sticker, a yellow bumper sticker with black text on his bumper of this, not of the DeLorean itself, but of this like van truck deal that's carrying and hauling the, the DeLorean, it says, one nuclear bomb can ruin your whole day. I don't know, maybe maybe that's not political. Yeah, it would probably be a message that anyone would agree with. Um, but it's kind of fun because we learned the DeLorean, uh, which maybe you want to describe in detail of kind of what this car is and why it was a special, a special thing and it wasn't just like a Ford Prius or a Ford Focus. Or a Ford Mustang. A Ford Mustang, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But this, this car, there's something special about it, not just that it... You know, is a DeLorean, but it it runs on a very particular fuel. So why don't you run through this? What does you What do you remember in about the car? Well, I mean, the DeLorean is is a special vehicle in general. In the early '80s, John Z. DeLorean, the creator of the Pontiac GTO muscle car and hideaway windshield wipers, by the way, hmm. a very clever engineer, designed the uh, DeLorean motor car. And uh, it's a sports car with a stainless steel construction and gullwing doors, so very kind of out there design. And those are the doors that don't open to the side, but they they, they open kind of up, up from upward. the bottom, yeah. And uh, just like a uh, the current Tesla Model X's rear doors mm. are also gullwing. But anyway, yeah. So it's uh, famous or infamous car, or famous car from an infam- infamous man. Uh, so it was uh, in the early '80s, kind of, kind of hard. They they were difficult to come by. I mean, they, they were expensive. Them, right? They they only made about 8,800 cars total in uh, in Ireland, in mm-hmm. uh, around Belfast, Ireland. To see kind of an exotic car like this, uh, you know, it just kind of set the stage for the whole time travel theme. I mean, it's it it basically is a spaceship, right? And it and it runs on diesel, right? Uh, or it runs on uh, gas? What does it do? Uh, it, uh, this this sucker is electrical, but or well. <laughs> anyway, no, it it runs on regular unleaded gas, but uh, you know that's that's what powers the car and then the time circuits. Of course, they needed a nuclear reaction to generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electricity. Uh, plutonium. Wait a minute. Are you are you telling me that this sucker is nuclear? Uh, so it's fun. So there's a there's some plutonium in a box, a, uh, like a yellow box with metal hinges. Uh, and he kicks it open, and inside this is there are these cylinders of what look like to be like water on the outside, and inside is some sort of test tube with a reddish or uh, amber-like material. Uh, can't tell if that's also liquid. It looks liquid, and he says that's plutonium. So he takes the plutonium and he puts it into the car, uh, turns the the cylinder, and drops the plutonium into the car. Uh, and I guess what this does is. Is it powers the the vehicle somehow? Uh, we're going to get into the details of that a little bit later. But where does he get the plutonium? Uh, Doc Brown says that he uh, obtained it from Libyan nationalists slash terrorists who stole it. Doc says that he w- secured the plutonium from the Libyans because he promised them that he'd make them a bomb. Uh, but instead, he gave them like an old shoddy 
bomb casing with this is funny uh pinball parts used pinball machine parts yeah not, not couldn't even give them new pinball parts that's probably what made them more upset was they got used pinball parts i mean with the increase of video games in the mid 80s you know your nintendo entertainment system and all mm-hmm. i feel like uh i i feel like that pinball machines time had run its course and they were kind of all used but you know <laughs> different strokes well the the libyans are, are probably not going to be too happy about that hopefully they they don't end up tracking him down at any point but so this this is where he gets the plutonium uh and i have some questions uh based on this uh these are what i think of when i think about this movie you know i, I would love to hear your thoughts on this kevin I, I don't really know how doc brown got connected to the libyans you know who approached who you know it's one of those things that if, if doc approached libyan nationalists and offered if they stole plutonium he would build them a bomb the knowing that he needed the plutonium to build his time machine it seems to me that maybe he approached them you know there's the whole not wanting to ruin the legacy of your favorite movie uh no, that's, what, that's what we do here <laughs> that is what we do um but i mean you gotta you gotta realize that doc brown had this very complicated machine that had very uh you know a structure designed around these particular weird cylinders and with their little red liquid pellets that would uh, drop into the uh, into the time machine to, to get energy to power the time circuits. But, I mean, he basically would have had to have known, he would have had to have designed this machine mm-hmm. to accommodate those, or that, that kind of infrastructure. That, and so it, the question is, did he already know what what was being used and therefore he specifically had to get that particular storage device for mm. for plutonium in order to operate his vehicle or um did he have the material and then finalize that i mean this stuff takes time to, to build and uh it take it took him his entire life savings uh mm-hmm. his, his entire yeah, family sure. fortune to realize the vision his vision of that day so um, yeah, it's really hard to say whether he had he had approached them or I mean, it's not like there's going to be. I mean, actually, on the side of his truck, it did say "scientist for hire." Right. So maybe it's, the Libyans saw that. It could, you know, it could be one of those things where he was known. I don't know if this is canon or if this is just some of the stuff from the cartoons or maybe the original scripts, uh, but he was known as like one of the world's premier nuclear physicist. Like he was a Manhattan Project, not involved but like that level of knowledge of like skill uh for his his abilities so maybe they approached him but either way you know maybe he was struggling for some kind of power source for his time machine and when they approached him about plutonium he was like oh yeah plutonium that would be great uh just get get that over to me and i'll and i'll do something with it um but if he approached them there's an incredible amount of uh really hard moral questions there because what if they killed people in the course of stealing the plutonium, right? And, you know, when they when they steal it, maybe they killed a guard or two. Uh, he never tells the FBI about the Libyans at any particular point because he doesn't want them to get traced back to him. I always just find that fascinating that maybe he's just such an eccentric scientist that none of these moral questions come to his mind. But either way, our, our main hero is definitely being involved somehow with, with Libyan nationalists. But one thing that's not clear to me is, you know, it's plutonium that's in the box, right? no idea what kind of plutonium this is there is a variety of different types of plutonium different types of isotopes there's some plutonium that are really good for making an atomic bomb there's some plutonium that's really bad for either an atomic bomb or a reactor so it's unclear about whether or not this is 238 which is a particular type of isotope of plutonium you know you see this in rtg reactors you know we talked about this in our episode on the martian the movie and the book uh rtg reactors that use plutonium 238 uh, which is cannot be used for a nuclear bomb, but it's pretty good for other um, types of, of power generation, as well as uh, plutonium-239, which is the good stuff if you want to build a plutonium-based uh, nuclear bomb. But weapons-grade plutonium, there's a particular grade of that that you need to be able to produce, and that's definitely not stored at a nuclear power plant. Plutonium-239, uh, just people who listen to the podcast know, it's a byproduct of uranium being burned in a nuclear power reactor. It's something that just happened. When you burn uranium at a certain amount of, amount of time, it turns into one element and then eventually decays into plutonium. Uh, when you have that, there are a lot of uh, plutonium-240, which is another byproduct, and that's what tends to be the most amount of plutonium 
that's generated you know, from the uranium as you're burning it, plutonium-240, very high rate of spontaneous fission. So it's not good in a nuclear bomb because if you, you know, no matter how you store it, it's either giving off too many neutrons and it's not safe to handle. It will kill whoever's holding on to it. You have to use machinery. You can't just touch it with gloves, no matter how well-designed Doc Brown's gloves are. Like if there's plutonium-240, it's going to give off neutrons and you're going to get sick and die. But you also have to get rid of all the 240 if you want to have 239 ready for a nuclear bomb. Because if there's 240 next to 239, it's giving too much uh, spontaneous fission. It's, it's affecting the 239, the good stuff that can do a supercritical reaction. If you have too much 240 in your plutonium core, it will fizzle when it comes time for a nuclear bomb to actually detonate when you want it to. So you have to chemically remove the 240, or what's called reprocessing, and get it down to less than 7% 240 in your configuration. Uh, reactor grade tends to have more than 18% plutonium-240. Uh, so it's really unclear whether or not the Libyans wanted Doc Brown to build them a, a full-scale plutonium nuclear weapon that would explode and destroy an entire city, or if they just wanted him to make a dirty bomb. It's unclear because they won't store weapons-grade plutonium at a nuclear power plant. But if it was a dirty bomb, there's so many better sources of radioactive material that's not necessarily plutonium, but it could be cesium or any other sort of dangerous material, hospitals, research centers that aren't national labs that they could have used. So I'm really unclear what they wanted. My first guess was that they were trying to build a nuclear bomb, uh, but maybe it was just an improvised explosive device with a nuclear material attached to it, radioactive material. So I don't know what... Have you always maybe assumed it was a nuclear bomb that they were trying to build, or if it was just a, a bomb with some plutonium attached to it? Well, I was going to say that I don't know why. I just thought of this now, but uh, if they were trying to make— I mean, how much plutonium is necessary to make a bomb, uh, a nuclear bomb, versus just a dirty bomb? Because they gave him that entire case right. of, uh, of pellets of plutonium, as he refers to them, so, I mean, really, would, would it have been necessary to give him that much material if all they wanted was a single bomb? So the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, defines what they call significant quantities of fissile material, so whether it's uranium or plutonium. And what this means is any sort of safeguard system, you know, uh, you have an enrichment facility, you have to make sure that this significant quantity, which is usually defined in kilograms, cannot go missing quantities below that, you know, you're never going to be able to account for every single amount of fissile material that runs through an enrichment facility because there's waste, there's uh, stuff that gets burnt off, there's stuff that goes missing. But as long as you can account for a, this significant quantity, which they find in the open source as the minimum you need to build a nuclear weapon. So for plutonium, it's eight kilograms of, of, of pl weapons grade plutonium. Now, if you do the right amount of configuration, if you have beryllium outside of your plutonium core, you can use that or say natural uranium uh, to reflect neutrons back into the center of the plutonium pit, which helps uh, increase the amount of supercritical activity. Hey, that's the name of the podcast. If you have a tamper device that holds it together, all these little like extra special, fancier ways of building a nuclear bomb, if you have that stuff, you can have greater efficiency and you can use less plutonium. You don't need eight kilograms of it. I would say eight kilograms is a lot more than what you saw in that box, right? Yeah, like, definitely. Significantly. Maybe Doc Brown took the plutonium and made it into this tube-like structure for his car. Mm. I don't know. Who knows? But it, it wasn't probably enough to build a nuclear bomb, but maybe the Libyans didn't know that. Hmm. Maybe that's why Doc Brown was comfortable with this moral question was he asked for this amount of plutonium and it was never enough to build a bomb in case they decided to go to another eccentric nuclear <laughs> engineer down the street. Yes, and I'm relieved to hear that because, you know, Doc Brown seems like a real stand-up guy. But I'll say this for the film. At least the plutonium wasn't glowing green. That's something I definitely appreciated. Plutonium most of the time is a very bright silvery metal in terms of its color. Uh, it becomes yellow, kind of olive-like when it's exposed to oxygen. You can make plutonium in the different colors, depending on when you mix it. When you make it into an alloy, you can mix it with other kinds of metals, or maybe you could dilute it in acid. Uh, plutonium is really easily diluted, so perhaps that's what's in the test tube. Plutonium, uh, when it undergoes a fission in a reactor, it can burn really hot and look like a red ember, 
But I don't think that's what's happening in those little tubes, right? That's probably no, not what's happening. Certainly doesn't look like it now. Um, but anyways, whatever whatever happens, you know, it's completely unclear. It's it's. I'm fairly certain that what's happening is it's not a plutonium reactor like we would imagine one for a nuclear power plant, right? It's not making heat to boil water to turn a turbine which produces electricity. That's not what's happening in the the, the engine of the DeLorean. It's some kind of radioactive material, you know, gamma rays or X-rays, and the machine is absorbing that and turning it and converting it into power. It needs 1.21, 1, 1.21 gigawatts. Kevin, why do you, you're, this is really kind of what you focus on for work, you know, power efficiency and all of that. Why don't you explain to me what 1.21 gigawatts is, what that means, and is that a, a lot of power? It seems like it's a lot of power. It makes Doc Brown in 1955, like, his hair catches on fire. Yeah, 1955 Doc. You can understand his surprise in, in that level of power needed to perform this menial time-traveling task. Also, he pronounces it as gigawatt, which is pretty funny. Yeah, that... that this scientist pronounces it the wrong way. But I need a nuclear reaction to, to generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electricity. 1.21 gigawatts! 1.21 gigawatts! Great Scott! What? What the hell is a gigawatt? I know, I, the, even the first time I saw the word gigawatt, I, I did not think for a moment that it could have been pronounced gigawatt. So this was an interesting, uh, mm -hmm. interesting approach to take. But, I mean, uh, a gigawatt or a gigawatt is an amount of energy. Um, it's an amount of power named after uh, Thomas Watt, I believe, of locomotive fame. It's basically a measurement of how quickly energy is transferred, uh, not the quantity of energy. But uh, 1.21 gigawatts, for instance, relative to some other things... California, the state of California, added about 1.07 gigawatts of residential rooftop solar photovoltaic capacity uh, to homes in 2016. And also by comparison, California currently has about 2.2 gigawatts of total nuclear capacity in the state. So, you know, add a, having a one mobile mm -hmm. 1.21 gigawatt reactor on a DeLorean is pretty substantial, I'd say. It, it sounds like the DeLorean, you know, when it uses the plutonium raw tube or whatever it happens to be, it doesn't um, produce energy over a long period of time. It's, like, very quick. So 1.21 gigawatts over, say, a month is not very much, right? It just means that it's uh, spread out over a long period of time. And it is that way ready to describe it? Because it also, you have to understand like how much electricity is being produced, but also how quickly, like the, what's the time frame here? Sure. I mean, and you know, think about your refrigerator, for instance. I mean, you might have a refrigerator that consumes 300 to 500 kilowatt hours, kilowatts over an hour. Mm -hmm. But, um, 400 kilowatt hours over the course of an entire year. Yeah, having uh, having 1.21 gigawatts, uh, which is which means a million. Yeah, right? over the course of seconds. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, quite the energy release. Mm -hmm. But if it was over a month, it would you know might be a little bit less. Sure, it's some absurd amount of power over a very short amount of time. You know, to get that working, right? You have to get your plutonium out of your plutonium box, and you have to wear a radiation suit, according to the film. Uh, so I'd love to talk about that a little bit here. Um, so this box looks pretty cool. box with, like, metal hinges, and it's yellow, so you know it's radioactive. Kind of reminds me of a steamer trunk, honestly. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been wanting one of these things. I've been asking for it. Maybe it's, like, a, a humidor or something along those lines, but at least for storage. But it has radiation markings on there and all that good stuff. I would say that it's, it's odd to me that the box wasn't disguised, because if you're trying to smuggle plutonium around you don't want to tell people it's plutonium it's lead lined you know which say they say you'll protect you from the plutonium but i would say that if it doesn't matter how lead lined this is if it's undergoing rapid fission or has lots of plutonium 240 the amount of lead lining that's in this case it's not really clearly enough uh, standard protocol calls for a protective shield made of 6.6 .6 feet of concrete or 1.3 feet of lead to block ionizing radiation. So unless Doc Brown invented a new type of radiation to shield, 
it's not nearly enough for this box to work. Yeah, maybe he should have been storing his plutonium on that truck, you know, just moving that around and had a, a separate trailer for the DeLorean. That might have been safe. In the original script, it, they called it a crate with purple radioactivity emblems labeled Extreme Danger Radioactive Plutonium. Authorized personnel only. Do not handle without radiation suit, as well as property of San Onofre Nuclear Power Plant, San Onofre, California. Uh, so I thought that was uh, an interesting maybe how they that transitioned from a giant purple crate to a smaller, cooler looking foam filled box. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want those little bits to to knock against each other. So nice, uh, nice padded foam filled uh, trunk seems logical. The foam is not that far from reality. So I have a picture here that I'll put up on our, on our show notes. It's from 1994. There was a case of plutonium being smuggled in a suitcase from Moscow to Munich. So in 1994, they, they detected small amounts of radiation coming out of the suitcase, and the customs were confused what this was, so they, they opened it up. And you can see this picture. You have this really big black suitcase, and then they broke it open, and there was a like an attache case that's metal. Uh, and inside of it is a foam protection system, which was what was used to store the lead pig, which is what they essentially it's like a big basket or like a lunch pail that holds plutonium or highly enriched uranium or some kind of radioactive material. Hmm. Um, this is really, you know, it looks a little bit like the case that we see in the movie. So I'll at least give them that credit that these things, when they're smuggled illegally, yeah, you have to have the foam there. Yeah. You know, you protect your violin, you protect your plutonium. Yeah, interestingly, I was going to say that uh, that silver case uh, actually looks like something Doc would store his cotton underwear in because <laughs> he's not sure if they have those in the future. So. Yep. Uh, you were joking that the when he puts his suitcase in the front of the DeLorean where the hood is, that's where the trunk is. In the car, right? Because the engine's in the back. There isn't enough storage place for both his suitcase and the plutonium box. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like Tim said, the DeLorean is a re- has a rear-mounted engine, and the storage, the trunk in the front, is not very big. So, if you account for the fact that a DeLorean is a two-seat car, no back seat, mm-hmm. tiny glove box, and a tiny trunk, it really makes you wonder where on earth. Is Doc planning on storing all of this uh, time traveling fuel as he as he bounces around? But you know, maybe he had some different ideas, or maybe he had a nice little lead line, a, a small lead line briefcase, or a little compartment in his underwear briefcase uh, that uh, he could store some extra plutonium. Maybe uh, Einstein the dog will have to sit on top of the plutonium box when it's in a passenger seat. Oh yeah, could be it. Yeah, uh, so long as he wears his seatbelt. <laughs> Well, we see Einstein the dog wearing a radiation suit, and we don't know who puts it on him because they don't show that scene taking place, but he's wearing a little radiation suit, and so are Doc and Marty when they have to open up the plutonium box. Uh, So they they wear this suit, uh, they take the plutonium out of the box, and they put it into the car, and then once it's in the engine, Doc said it's okay to remove the suit because uh, it's safe because it's lead-lined or something along those lines. Uh, of course, uh, because I am who I am, I have a couple questions and issues with the radioactive protection suit. So bear with me here, Kevin. Uh, so radiation suits, what they're designed for is, you know, they have a little bit of, of protection against some types of radiation, uh, but their primary function as a hazmat suit is to protect the individual wearing it against inhalation of radioactive particles in the dust or anything along those lines that could be breathed in and cause damage internally or uh, that material being in contact with the human skin if they drop the tube on the ground or something. If there's ionizing radiation coming out of the tube itself, it doesn't matter uh, whether or not they're wearing a radiation suit. The suit will do nothing. And I really also don't see a a radiation detection counting dosimeter uh, on anywhere in their person. So that's bad form uh, on Doc's uh, point there. Um, But you you were, were talking about this when we were watching the movie. You think it's probably because he was worried about dropping... The plutonium tube on the ground? Yeah, maybe. Maybe, I mean, right? Got, got to be careful with these things. Uh, but if people think that a radiation suit is enough, like if there's fallout landing on the ground outside, and you put on a radiation to suit and you go outside, uh, that's not going to do anything. There's ionizing radiation. It's going to get through the suit, and it's going to get into your DNA, and it's going to corrupt it, and you're going to uh, end up getting pretty sick. Yeah, I don't know. I just uh, suddenly remember that one scene in The Simpsons where Radioactive Man is like, 
<laughs> the goggles do nothing. My eyes, the goggles do nothing. Uh, I love how Einstein's radioactive suit doesn't cover his entire body. It's just kind of a like a rain like a dream jacket. But doesn't he look cute in it? Uh, it's adorable. And I have a few other kind of random questions about the plutonium car. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. I don't really know uh, what the car does with the plutonium. Say it absorbs radioactive material and or radio radioactive particles or gamma rays or something. It, it's clearly not like working like a nuclear power plant. But what do you think it does with the spent fuel rods when it's done with them? Does it just vaporize them to the point where they're no longer there and the plutonium is gone? Is it shooting the plutonium with some kind of like vaporizing thing that makes it go away? Or is it storing them like a like a fancy Keurig in your office where it's constantly like taking all the Keurig cups? Right, yeah, I know. That's it's really interesting to think about. Because I mean when you when they when they load the plutonium into the car, it very clearly has that smaller cylinder that drops into mm -hmm. the reactor and, you know, goes away. So it's like does that is that some sort of glass or plastic material that just gets melted as part of the process or does yeah it's really it's no because plutonium is usually a metal you can make it into a gas you know like a lot of different objects you can make it into uh you know a gas or, or, or some sort of a liquid potentially but most of the time it's a it's a metal form so i don't really know what they're doing with it also doc brown has invented a machine that can take pure radioactivity and convert that into power in a very efficient, large-scale manner, that's a Nobel Prize-winning award already, and that he should give that to the rest of the world. You know, right. would be able to deal with all of our nuclear waste and all of this. He doesn't want to share that with us. He just wants to travel through time to go watch the Wild West and all that kind of fun stuff. But the Libyans that we talked about earlier, the ones that he stole the plutonium from, um, they've come back, right? My God, they found me. I don't know how, but they found me. <laughs> Run for it, Tim! <laughs> well, Doc doesn't run far enough. He His gun jams, and the Libyans uh, use what appears to be an AK-47, and, and in front of Marty and Einstein, shoot Doc Brown down. That's very traumatic. Yeah, he gets hit with a number of bullets. Uh, none in the head, which is a key point here. Fortunate. Marty jumps in the car after they they fueled it up with plutonium earlier. He gets in a little bit of a chase with his VW van, uh, with the Libyans uh, constantly, the gun jams at the most uh, inopportune moments. Uh, opportune, I guess, for, for Marty on the receiving end. Uh, but the car gets over 88 miles per hour, and because of the time that was set in the time machine earlier, he goes to November 1955. Right, yeah. I will also point out, though, that the time circuits were not technically engaged. It was when Marty was uh, perhaps uh, shifting that uh, that's what bumps the... Uh, the time circuit's on, and I mean, really, you know, as, as a driver of a manual transmission vehicle, you knew, you need to take into account the space <laughs> around the stick. I mean, even my cup holder interferes. If I have something <laughs> in my cup holder, that interferes with my shifter. So, uh, I mean, this is this is Time Machine version 1.0, so uh, I figured there's some learning steps that need to be uh, followed. Here. Yeah. Uh, so when Marty goes back to 1955, here's a bunch of alarms. On the car, there's this little dial that says Rotogen's chamber uh, are, is too low, so Marty is able, isn't able to get back in time uh, or back to the future. Uh, a Rotogen is a unit of measurement uh, for the exposure of X-rays or gamma radiation. It's very interesting. It's, these types of measurements are very particular. They don't just measure how much radiation is there. It's, it's a particular thing that they could measure. It's uh, electrical displacement of the ionizing radiation in a very specific set of conditions, which is like dry air, so no humidity, zero degrees Celsius, one atmosphere of pressure. So in, a, in ideal conditions, this amount of radiation can produce this amount of joules, all that kind of stuff. So it measures that. It's named after a German physicist, Wilhelm Rodigen, who discovered X-rays. Good Tag, ich heiße Wilhelm Röntgen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this chamber, this dial, says it goes all the way to 600. And that's about as far as the, the dial itself goes. So I was like, wow, that must be a, a lot. Um, but 600 is not an, an unheard of amount of radiation. It is the lethal dose of uh, radiation when exposed to a human. And in most instances, is that will lead to fatalities in 100% of the time within, you know, say, six months. It's not like the upper limit of radiation. So it's, a, it's an amount that's dangerous if you get exposed to it. 
but it's not like an unheard of amount of radiation that he needs Doc Brown to produce whatever thing for his flux capacitor to flux. Uh, well, it's good to know uh, when you're approaching the lethal dose amount. So, uh, yep, I, I feel like it's a gauge, a warranted gauge. It's helpful. Uh, so Marty, Marty, uh, he goes back to the past. Uh, we have this fun scene of Marty. Um, people thinking he's a space alien invader because of his weird car and his radiation suit. Uh, he gets shot again, but fortunately, because people's guns in this movie don't really work against Marty. Like everyone else's stormtroopers trying to shoot him, <laughs> um, everything's fine. So he ends up running over the pine tree of uh, the one of two pine trees of Old Peabody's farm, because uh, where we realize slowly, right? How do we realize we're in 1955? Uh, well, you know, uh, it's it's not until he drives by the uh, the Lion Estates construction area, the the wide open field of nothingness that is the uh, neighborhood that Marty lives in in 1985. Mm-hmm. That it really sets in that he's somewhere strange. You see the old clock tower is working in the town square. Uh, gas stations have these fleet of attendants that come over and help anyone with their car. And the, you see a movie theater uh, playing a Barbara Stanwyck and Ronald Reagan movie. So now you really know this is this is a time and place that we're here. Uh, and this is kind of the point in the movie where I, I think if you've seen Back to the Future, you don't really want to hear us just kind of run through the plot. Uh, Back to the Future, you know, we can go through a little bit of the main points here. We'll hit on some of the nuke stuff. But broadly, what we find out is is that Marty needs to get back to the future, right? So he tries to contact Doc Brown in the past. Uh, but while he's in this cafe owned by a, a racist owner who doesn't like the fact that his uh, black employee wants to be mayor at some point of the town, uh, we find out that uh, George McFly, Marty's father, he's a teenager – there uh and he gets bullied by this guy biff tannen the bully that we see earlier in the movie uh but him as as a young high schooler too a series of things kind of take place where marty uh ends up uh, accidentally taking the place of when marty's mother would have met his father marty's dad got hit by a car because he fell out of a tree peeping in on lorraine which is part marty's mom and we find out one that Marty's mother was a very promiscuous woman who would go and chase after, you know, promiscuous by the definition of her his mother later on. Sure, uh, but much to the s- surprise of Marty. And that his dad was kind of a, a perf, a, a, a peeping Tom. So we part of the movie it was an idea that Bob Gale had, one of the screenwriters, and said, what would it be like if I met my parents when I was in high school, and they were in high school too? Would we have been friends, or would we have learned things about them that, Maybe we wouldn't have liked to have known. <laughs> so that's kind of what the, the main thrust of the narrative side of this movie is. But Marty and Doc, they get together. Marty convinces him that he's, free, he's legitimate, that he knows about the time machine. Uh, Marty uh, and Doc, they need to get together to get back to the future. A couple other kind of random things here. Uh, at one point, Doc Brown is watching the, the VHS tape of uh, the time machine travel. And what does Doc Brown say when he sees wearing radiation suits? Well, this this is a radiation suit. Radiation suit? Of course. Because of all the fallout from the atomic wars. A bleak outlook from a man who, I mean, he, he knows some things. So, I mean, he knows the repercussions of, of what... Uh, what could what could come about, especially as somebody who later plays around with plutonium himself? Right. It, it's it's very yeah, it's a blasé attitude of what the future is going to be held. He just assumes that nuclear wars are going to happen and that we're going to be fine as long as we don radiation suits. Uh, I don't know. I think that would be one of my first questions is, to turning to Marty would be, wait, so the world ends with a nuclear war? Apparently, he doesn't think that. Apparently, he thinks that it's just like World War II and there'll be fights with some kind of nuclear weapon, but it's not. Clearly, the first item of his his on his his docket, because he would ask Marty, "Do you maybe not want to go back to that world?" Well, yeah, that is that is a valid question. I mean, and look at Doc Brown though; they're they're only ten years past uh, the end of World War II, so I mean, it's yeah. still very fresh in his mind. Whereas Marty might not be thinking about these things. I mean, in 1985, Three Mile Island incident would have occurred only six years prior mm-hmm. so uh maybe even then and uh, and of course if marty's 17 years old he would have been 11 when that happened and maybe that still wasn't registering for him so i mean marty versus doc uh their mm. their impressions of the 
the effects of nuclear war and, and all of that. It's, it's very interesting. Think about it like this. Terminator, right? Mm. Terminator 2 uh, or Terminator 1, any of the Terminator movies, which we covered on the podcast too. You know, you imagine somebody coming from the future back to the past and it says, you know, if we don't do this, a, a nuclear war is going to take place and the world will end essentially as we know it and we need to stop this from happening. And instead, the main characters of our movie were like, oh no, we'll get you back to that future. We won't try to stop it from happening. We'll just get you back to the future. Why are we going around messing around with time? That's kind of what Doc Brown's attitude is here. Well, if he assumes that the future involves a series of nuclear atomic wars. That, yeah, it is. it does kind of conflict. He doesn't say, like, well, how can I stop this from happening? He says, how can I get you back to the future? And, and also your parents have them get together. Right. I, I That's mean, his priority. Doc's initial reaction to to marty being in the past is you need to stay here you need to not change anything and later it is don't tell me about my future Mm because i don't want to know because the implications of altering the future and then it also ultimately boils down to "Eh, what what the hell yeah 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 so there's a couple other you know plot points that we can mention here uh Marty needs to get his parents together because he took the place of his father. According to these time travel rules established in Back to the Future, you know, there are alternate timelines that end up getting taken place. So if you alter time in the past, you just create a new parallel timeline. And you exist off of that unless you go before whatever was changed. And then you can alter it and get back to something more cl- similar uh, to your timeline. So Marty's mission is, is several fold. It's, it's to get his dad to summon the courage to ask Lorraine out to the enchantment under the sea dance where they first kiss. Uh, it's to avoid the sexual advancements of his mother. That's kind of probably priority number one. Priority number three would be to fight off Biff and his bullies uh, that are trying to get at him. Uh, there's this great chase scene with where Marty essentially invents the skateboard. Uh, and then he also needs to generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electrical power to activate the time machine so we can return home uh so we see a lot of fun mischief going around trying to get those things uh happening uh including him tricking george mcfly his dad by drawing upon george mcfly's like sci-fi love and he wears the radiation suit and he pretends to be darth vader from the planet vulcan (laughs) And convinces him, you have to go and ask Lorraine out to a dance. Of course, in my like hundredth time watching this movie now with you, uh, we noticed a little small detail. So take yeah. a drink here, anyone that's following along. Uh, in George McFly's room, there's a box for like a model aircraft. Uh, you know, the kind you would piece together with you know, glue and paint. Revel and all that. or Revel uh, yep. plastic model, yeah. And it's for a B-29, which is the same model airplane, the boxcar and the Enola Gay that dropped the atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I don't know why. I mean, it doesn't really seem like it fits his his nerddom. It seems to be more sci-fi as opposed to historical right. world war. It seemed like you'd more likely have uh, some kind of, I don't even know what, like a Flash Gordon? I don't know what sure, 1955 like Flash Gordon is. ray gun or something like that. I don't know. Than a, than, a, than a B-29. But anyways, I think it's another one of those, the, the root of the nuke story kind of seeping up to the surface here a little bit. So I thought that was kind of fun. Um, we eventually get to the point where uh, that's the Enchantment Under the Sea dance, uh, Marty and George and <laughs> has, his, has his plan so that uh, Marty will uh, convince Lorraine that George is the one that she should really be seen. Uh, and all this kind of crazy stuff happens. Eventually, the parents get together. Marty invents rock and roll. Biff gets his comeuppance. Uh, the time machine is set up in this big thunderstorm because they're going to have the time machine drive down the street. And as soon as the lightning bolt hits at 10.04 p.m., right, which will f- produce electricity down this wire, the exact moment that the car comes under and it hooks it, the wire, and it gets the power. Straight into the flux capacitor. Right. Makes the flux capacitor flux, which <laughs> as your perfectly themed T-shirt says, I appreciate you wearing that. All that stuff happens, and that's kind of the big climax uh, of the movie. And I think it's a little bit of a, another fun element here. So take another shot. Uh, the movie theater at the end of the street where Marty is traveling near the clock tower is playing a movie called The Atomic Kid, uh, which is a 1954 movie. So really very appropriate that this movie would be playing right about this time. Uh, this is a movie stars Mickey Rooney, you know, as we know now from 60 Minutes. Uh, but this movie was one of the strong inspirations for the entire idea 
of the original script for Back to the Future. Uh, this movie, I will cover it eventually in the podcast. I don't think it's that great, uh, but it's very weird. It involves a guy eating like a peanut butter sandwich uh, accidentally on a nuclear test site. And there's a, an above ground, like in the high atmosphere test. And it produces radiation that falls on him and it gets him superpowers. And he helps the FBI solve crimes for a little while. Right, because that's who I would want to help as soon as I get these superpowers would yep. be the FBI. So it's called The Atomic Kid, and it's playing uh, in the movie theater at the end of the street. And I never really noticed that until like maybe like a fairly recent viewing. Uh, and it was kind of a fun little tiny thing here, but make sure you take your drink uh, for that nuke reference. Uh, so we're back in 1985. What happens then, Kevin? Uh, well, Marty returns to 1985, hoping to save his good friend Doc Brown's life, but lo and behold, the ever-unreliable DeLorean uh, leaves him stranded as he watches the Libyan terrorists drive by in their marginally more reliable uh, <laughs> Volkswagen uh, Type 2. And, uh, and you were saying this DeLorean, it's reliability issues. This is pretty accurate? Yeah, yeah. I mean... Um, I once had the opportunity about 11 years ago to drive a DeLorean, uh, and, which was, you know, dream come true and still a wonderful experience to have had. But the owner of the DeLorean was telling me about all the little nitpicky problems that those cars had, uh, you know, all the electrical issues. I mean, they were underpowered. They were just never the, the quality sports car that John Z mm. had hoped for. But uh, Sometimes your time circuits accidentally go to the Wild West. Right, yeah. You know, you can, you can never know what happens with a, with a bolt of lightning. I mean, I guess Marty's lucky that his bolt of lightning didn't send him back to 1885. Yeah, Whew, that would have been... Uh, end of the movie, right? <laughs> um, so back in 1985, it turns out that Doc was wearing a bulletproof vest because he read a note that Marty wrote him that said he was going here. You were going to be killed by terrorists uh, in the future, so make sure that you avoid that somehow. Take precautions. Take precautions. Uh, and that precaution, which Doc said he wasn't going to read that note, then eventually he does. It was a bulletproof vest. So fortunately, he doesn't get shot anywhere in the head. Uh, or anywhere else, um, but he survives. The, the Libyans, uh, they crash into some kind of, like, a... One-hour photo, I think it was. <laughs> so it looks like the Libyans are, 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 are dead, perhaps? Um, they don't come after Doc and Marty, so it looks like they crashed into something. Um, Maybe they weren't wearing their, their seatbelts in, the, uh, in their Volkswagen. Well, here, here's a question I have for you. Doc Brown does not want the FBI to find out he has the plutonium, correct? Sure. So does he cover up the, the, the death of the Libyans? Does he... Go and shoot the Libyans in case they were still alive. Ooh, Does he cover up the that bleak? The, that is dark stuff right there. Because eventually, if the FBI finds two dead Libyans, they're going to find out where they were living, and they're going to try to find out where the plutonium went to. Right? Hmm. That's that's an interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean the the RPG and the AK forty sevens that those guys were hauling around might have been. Uh, yeah, might have led to a bit of an investigation, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, Doc can only have hoped that uh, they did not survive that uh, that little hut <laughs> fiasco and that uh, he didn't have to take matters into his own hands. That would have been safe. At least they should have shown the RPG go off and blow up the, the van. But to me, it looks like they're, they're it probably not in great shape, but if he's wearing a, a seatbelt. Oh, you, you apparently have never been in an old <laughs> Volkswagen van because those things, those seatbelts, I mean, they're... They're not retractable. They're not anything. I mean, they they're pretty marginal. But I mean, and never mind the fact that you're basically on the front of the vehicle with just nothing That's but true. a layer no of sheet front. metal and uh, and uh, big plastic and steel dashboard in front of you. So, I mean, I'm not. I, they could have walked away from that, but I'm not holding my breath that uh, it would have mm. been a fun thing to walk away from. So okay, let's let's say that everything's going to work out fine for them, uh, Marty. Uh, and, and Doc kind of reunite. The Doc says he's going to go into the future. Uh, so he travels 30 years into the future, and you kind of see him drive away uh, and do that. Marty's back at home. In the morning, he finds out that his house, it looks really different, right? His 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 brother and sister are there. His brother's wearing a suit. Still wear, living at home, but, yeah. but now he wears a suit to the office. His sister is allowed to date men, uh, multiple men at the exact same time. And, sh and the mother and father are, like, in love together, right? The dad looks very confident. The mother is 
doesn't appear to be drinking all the time. So that's quite a, a, a new situation that he's found himself in. Even though Biff Tannen tried to sexually assault Lorraine when they were in high school, apparently he's still allowed to like hang around the house and work as a an auto detailer he's around there and he shows the new book that marty's dad wrote and all this stuff so everything looks great doc then all of a sudden shows up when marty and jennifer are trying to kiss because they're reuniting after this this long week to marty but looks like just a couple of hours to to jennifer doc shows up in a new fancy time machine with weird clothes on and he says he keeps came back from the future instead of using plutonium his his car runs on the Mr. Fusion reactor and uses biomass to produce some sort of power generation for the flux capacitor. Uh, and then he says, we have to go to the future to save Marty's kids. And we have to go right now because that's how time travel works. I guess. Yes. Um, and that's kind of where the movie ends. So I think that, that pretty much wraps up Back to the Future 1. There's a little bit more nuke stuff in the 30th anniversary DVD box set. Uh, I was hoping you had the 30th anniversary, but you had the 25th anniversary. I I jumped the gun by five years. I didn't know they were going to keep going every five years like this. Uh, So on the 30th anniversary of the box set, there's this featurette, like a short movie called Doc Brown Saves the World. And I tried to find this because it has some interesting nuke story uh, online, but it it wasn't available. What you can find is what's called Doc Saves the World, which is another – Another same name, but a different thing, which was the video that the Universal Studios ride was called. That's what, that was kind of fun to watch because I remember that ride, but it's not this wacky story, which is in October 21st, 2015, that timeline where Marty, Jennifer, and Doc in Back to the Future 2 go into the future. Right before that, Doc Brown arrives in the DeLorean and says there's going to be a nuclear holocaust in October 21st, 2045. So 30 years from that date. And the reason for this nuclear holocaust is four inventions that were created. The food hydrator, self-lacing shoes, the hoverboard, and the Mr. Fusion. And this is how the Back to the Future wiki describes a nuclear holocaust coming from those items. Uh, The food hydrator, the self-lacing shoes, and the hoverboard make the world lazy and obese, leading to widespread waste. Hoverboards lead to hover cars and people throwing trash out of the windows, causing a giant trash storm in 2021. All of this trash needs to be disposed of, which leads to the creation of 100 million Mr. Fusions to basically like eat all the trash. All of the Mr. Fusions have tiny little nuclear reactors, and because of some kind of trick that Griff Tannen, the guy who in Back to the Future 2 ends up like being uh, chased by Marty. Ch- he, he chases Marty, and then and Marty outsmarts him, and then Griff ends up like running into the glass front of the clock tower and all that stuff, like the courthouse. Yeah. He does some sort of like media company and tries to have a virus that goes around, so it would say the word butthead on every screen in America and the world. Well, that causes all of the nuclear reactors of the Mr. Fusions to explode on the exact same time, which causes a nuclear holocaust around the world. In, in this short story, Doc has to go around destroying these inventions so that they don't actually get invented. Uh, and then that prevents the, the nuclear holocaust from happening. And it's supposedly some idea of, well, look, in our current future, in our 2018 timeline or whatever uh, that we live in, none of these things exist, but most of the other ideas in Back to the Future exist. So in our timeline, Doc erased all of these inventions, so that's why we don't have them today. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that if... Uh... Black and Decker, Nike, and Mattel knew that their <laughs> devices were going to lead to, you know, this kind of nuclear holocaust in the future, then uh, I, I'm sure that they would have been totally fine with never creating those particular uh, mm. items, those products. But it's never clear, at least in the description I found online, how Doc goes about destroying these inventions. Does he take a prototype and smash it? Or does he kill the people who invent these things? Like linda hamilton's character would have tried to do in terminator 2 with dyson or does he convince them like they eventually do with dyson to give up his technology like that's a crazy story to do with anything let alone four or five different types of like world changing inventions i don't know yeah no that's this this uh doc brown saves the world is sounds kind of back to the future levels of darkness but then 
leaping over the cliff and just going face first into it. So it's an interesting spin on things. And I haven't seen it. Uh, maybe it looks good with because uh, it's Christopher Lloyd playing a live action version of uh, of Doc Brown in twenty whatever seventeen eighteen whatever this came out. So maybe it, maybe it looks it plays a little bit better than it reads. But I just thought that was kind of funny. So let's get uh, super critical here. We've already kind of run through the the plot itself, but there's a few more points I think that would be really interesting for us to to chat about here. Uh, we we mentioned the Mister Fusion, uh, home energy reactor slash nuclear holocaust causing device. Uh, this I think is a pretty funny thing at the end of the Back to the Future one, and immediately the start of Back to the Future two, which takes place, you know, that's it overlaps a little bit with the ending. Uh, this was supposedly a, a biomass creation. Uh, so you would put in trash, and it would convert it to something using fusion, perhaps. It's kind of unclear what it is. Um, but you, you were pointing out that it's like a Krupp's coffee grinder. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's an old uh, old coffee grinder with the big white thing on that uh, that Mr. Fusion is <laughs> on the DeLorean. And I love the little parody of Mr. Coffee. Uh, it, <laughs> seems, it seems like that's kind of what it is for. Uh, but I thought that opens up some pretty interesting questions for what the future is like. If everyone were to have one of these Mr. Fusions, you know, is it free energy? Does it solve the world's energy problems? Well, I mean, you look at it nowadays. I mean, there's uh, use of municipal solid waste uh, being burned for power and biomass uh, also being used for power generation and everything. So, I mean, but it's imagine kind of that. But imagine that like every household has one of these things. Yeah, it's it's a future that uh, maybe I don't quite see happening quite yet, but mm. uh, maybe. Well, I would be worried, too, if you give nuclear fusion reactors that apparently can explode and cause a nuclear holocaust, and you just give those to everybody around the world. I don't know. That's uh, The safeguards on that alone would be pretty crazy, let alone flying cars. And you imagine all the bad drivers you see around the world. Now you're going to give them a flying car that they can fly into buildings and schools and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but anyways, I thought it was kind of fun that the original script for Back to the Future 2 – the Mr. Fusion was called the Westinghouse Fusion Energizer. Westinghouse, is, as some of us know, is a, a nuclear power company that's now gone bankrupt. It's one of the was one of the largest in the United States. Uh, but anyways, that's kind of fun the connection there. Uh, let's go through what we've been hinting at a lot, which is the original script for Back to the Future, because the movie itself has a lot of nuke stuff. Um, but I don't know how much of this you knew, or how much of you know you may have been uh, involved in. The, you had all your documentary extra features on your 25th anniversary <laughs> back to the future but these were things that i really did not know until i started doing research for this podcast episode like i never read the original script which uh the documentary that we watched about back to the future called um back in back in time uh said that the original script for back to the future is a perfect script it's a script that they teach in screenwriting school to people here's what a script looks like uh, if you really want to do it really well uh, so this original script, uh, the time machine was not a DeLorean. It was like a refrigerator, like a box, a lead line box that you would zap, and that's what sent somebody back in time. Um, they they were going to use that as the, the whole system of how you would travel through time. Uh, the DeLorean was eventually chosen because it had gold ring doors and could look like a spaceship, which was pretty cool, a good decision. Um, they concerned, they were concerned that the, the lead line refrigerator wasn't like engaging enough. You couldn't have a, a, an exciting chase with the refrigerator. You'd have yeah. to just attach the refrigerator to a car. And if you're going to do that, you might as well just have it be a car. Right. Never mind the fear of children climbing into old refrigerators and, yeah. you know, getting stuck. You know, that would be kind of terrifying. Which is what happens in the movie Ladybug, Ladybug, which is we covered on the podcast uh, when we talked about the Hawaii uh, ICBM missile scare. Gabe and I covered this really old 60s movie from called Ladybug, Ladybug, where a kid gets stuck in a refrigerator at the end. So very sad. Uh, Knight Rider with Kit the car and David Hasselhoff the... The Hoff. Uh, he was very popular <laughs> at the time, so that made a lot, more, a lot of sense. But anyways, the original script for this movie, it had so much nuclear content that the opening scene of the movie was nuclear imagery. And let me describe this here in my best uh, screenwriting voice. Interior, high school, classroom, day. A weird flickering white light strobes the screen, accompanied by a projector noise and an off-screen control voice. Five, four, three, two, one, detonate. The light becomes brighter as we pan over to Marty McFly, 17, a good-looking kid, wearing a Porsche mirrored sunglasses, 
the mirrored sunglasses reflect a mushroom cloud of an atomic explosion. The red hot opening music kicks in. Main title sequence. That's the power of love. Like that's how the movie starts instead of a bunch of clocks going around. That's the original script. So apparently the students were watching in high school a 16 millimeter documentary about nuclear test uh, that would occur in the 1950s. What would your impression be if that was the first scene in a movie about yeah. time travel? I mean, that would have been quite a quite a balls to the wall way to start off a movie about time travel. I mean, yeah, pretty different, huh? Yeah, very very different from what we ended up with. Uh, there's a couple exchanges between Marty and a high school teacher about the danger of atomic weapons, and here's how it starts. In a in a textbook, there's a photograph of an, a mushroom cloud, with the caption "Last above ground atomic test." March 18, 1952, Atkins, Nevada. A hand writes the initials MM plus SP in the clouds and draws an arrow as if it was a valentine and writes, how about the dance on Saturday? We'll have a blast. Appreciate the pun there. <laughs> uh, and I'll be the teacher and you can be Marty. How about that? Okay. Uh, the teacher's name is Mr. Arkey. There were only three above-ground atomic tests in the United States, so the government took every opportunity to study the effects of radiation. Actual single-family tract homes were constructed on the test site, totally furnished with refrigerators, TVs, furniture, anything you can find in a typical home, just so scientists could learn what kind of damage an atomic bomb would do to a typical town. They even put mannequins in the houses, just like auto crash tests. Marty tears the page out of his textbook and winks at Susie Parker, the cute girl across the aisle. They exchange a smile, and he tosses the folded paper to her. The teacher continues, But the fact remains today, 30 years after those early nuclear tests, the threat of nuclear annihilation is as great as it ever was. Certainly, nuclear annihilation is something you must all have thought about. Any questions, comments, ideas, anyone? No reaction from the class. No one has a hand up. No one seems interested. <laughs> Mr. Arkey says, I am talking about the complete and total destruction of the entire world. Doesn't anyone have anything to say about it? Yeah, you want to know what I think about atomic bombs? Well, I'd kind of like to see one. You'd like to see a nuclear holocaust? Not a holocaust. Mr. McFly here wants to nuke it all just so he can see it. Unfortunately, the way things are going, you may get your wish. You may see the entire annihilation of the world. That's how this movie starts. That, yeah, that is, that is some dark stuff right there. I mean, I get it. Some men like to watch the world burn, but that is, this is 1985. This is a 17-year-old kid in passing notes in, uh, in a high school class. I mean, come on, man. I, but I do associate with the teacher a little bit. You know, trying to talk to people like our when we're at a friend's house and we're at a party, say it's Memorial Day weekend and it's a barbecue. And I'm like, hey, have you guys seen the latest nuke movie? Like, have you guys seen this? Do you have any thoughts about the nuke content of uh, Back to the Future or Jaws? What do you guys think about this? Anything? Uh, so I, under, I associate with that a little bit. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, the original ending for the movie uh, was the original nuke the fridge scene. Um, it involved Doc Brown attaching the time machine, again, in this situation, a lead line refrigerator, to the top of a car so that Marty would drive straight into an above-ground nuclear test. Solar panels would collect the radiation and power the machine so that right before it would have been vaporized, uh, it would travel through time. And apparently they drew the idea from this Atomic Kid uh, movie. Uh, the setup here, uh, how about, do you want to be Doc Brown or Marty? I'll go Doc Brown. Okay, so this is like they're in Doc Brown's office, and they're trying to figure out how they're going to generate the 1.2 gigawatts of electricity. So you're, you're Doc Brown. All right. Well, I found an energy source that can generate the 4,200 reds that we need. An atomic bomb. Professor, you can't be serious. I am serious. If we could get you the time machine and the power converter in the vicinity of an atomic test, we can send you back to the future. You're talking crazy. An atomic blast would melt me and the time machine in a matter of seconds. You forget. Time travel is instantaneous. The time machine would melt, but you would have already traveled through time. Of course, it's a moot point regardless. The only place atomic bombs are detonated is in the Army's Nevada test site. 
those tests are kept absolutely top secret. Something suddenly occurs to Marty, and he bolts back upstairs. Marty rushes into the bedroom and goes through the pockets of his Porsche jacket. Underneath the picture of the mushroom cloud is the caption, Blast Above Ground Atomic Test, 15 megatons, March 18th, 1952, Atkins, Nevada. So that's uh, the equivalent of the we know when the lightning is going to strike the clock tower scene. Um, that's crazy. It's such a weird thing. Here's my little note I put here. Uh, this is completely nonsensical. Uh, not only was it the last atmospheric test of the United States in November 1962, uh, Atkins, Nevada, I don't know what that is. All the U.S. Uh, can test, most of them took place in the Nevada test site near Las Vegas. I do not know why they couldn't have just called it the Nevada test site. Why did they have to make up this city? Maybe it was trademarked. I don't, do not know <laughs> why they did that. But anyways, I thought that was pretty fascinating. Uh, so a little quick discussion here. Would this movie have worked as well for you with these scenes, and that's what ends up happening instead of the clock tower stuff? It's it's hard to I, well. The question is, would it have been as as would it have been as PG as it was? Hmm. Would I have seen it at such a young age and had it become kind of a foundation for my interest in these things so early on in life? You know, I can't help but think of the much later Indiana Jones, um, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. And uh, thinking how ridiculous it was to see somebody fly through the air in a, in a quote, lead-lined refrigerator. So this is definitely where they got the idea for that. So George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, you know, got together and they worked on Indiana Jones. That's where that came from. It was a repurposed idea from the original script to Back to the Future. Even down to, they really love this scene of, like, people walking into a neighborhood and seeing mannequins everywhere and being like, oh, my gosh, I'm on a test site, and it's today, and it's five minutes from now. Oh, <laughs> gosh, which is a scene in The Atomic Kid. So all this stuff draws back to The Atomic Kid. So maybe we, we do have to cover it on the podcast at some point. But uh, we covered The Kingdom of the Crystal Skull on a, an episode with uh, Gabe and one of our friends, Alex. One of our many friends named Alex, but we covered that a particular episode. So check that out if you haven't seen that one already. So the last little bit of, of the nuclear connection, the last maybe have a tiny little bit of liquor left in your bottle uh, to take a shot, uh, is the random connection that Doc Brown has. So when he, in, in Doc Brown's bio, it says that he used to spend summers when he was a kid with his uncle, Otto Von Brown, because d- the Von Browns were, uh, the, they originally were the, the Von Brauns, Right, I think that's what it was, and that's when he would ch- uh, came over from Germany. His family. This is kind of uh, funny because it sounds a lot like Werner von Braun, who was the German scientist uh, who worked with the Nazis to build the V two rocket program, and then eventually, as part of Operation Paperclip, uh, came into the United States and helped the U S out with their nuclear ICBM and missile tech, including the space program. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just adding that connection onto it, but. It's kind of funny. Right? It's, it seems too coincident to not be intentional. I, I feel like uh, that had to have been a thought. I mean, come on. Smart German yeah. scientist, Brown, von Braun. It's because everything in here is about connecting history to uh, the present and the past and the future. So, uh, yeah, All right. The last thing I want to talk about here, uh, nuke-wise, is the Libyans, right? Because they talk about the Libyans. The Libya today no longer has a nuclear program. The, the weapons of mass destruction program has been shut down. Gaddafi has been overthrown. But we hear Libya a lot in the news, right, about the Libya model with John Bolton, the national security advisor to President Donald Trump, has talked about North Korea in our the current negotiations needs to follow with the quote-unquote Libya model and that really upset the North Koreans. And it'd be kind of fun here to talk about that because we're watching a movie about Libyans trying to get help on building some kind of nuclear bomb. So Libya's nuclear program has its roots in the 1970s. Uh, but it really never got further than a couple of unassembled, mostly unassembled, uranium enrichment centrifuges and centrifuge parts they purchased through the AQ Khan black market network run out of Pakistan. Radical elements within Libya wanted a nuclear bomb program to counter Israel. They wanted to make some money on it, and they wanted to be able to promote their revolutionary policies abroad. The Libyans politely asked China in the 1970s to sell them some nukes. Uh, China politely declined. They then tried Pakistan, who made a little bit of progress. Some of the Libyans went into Pakistan as scientists to try to see how their program worked. But then once a new military government came in Pakistan, they kicked out the Libyans 
because they didn't like Qaddafi. The Libyans tried then to recruit some former Soviet scientists that were involved in the weapons program when the Cold War ended, but that was unsuccessful. Uh, so it really wasn't working until there was a Swiss nuclear engineer, Frederick Tinner, kind of a Doc Brown type, uh, who was the foreign and technical director of the Libyan nuclear program. He helped the Libyans pr uh, procure the enrichment parts in the mid-1990s, and he knew AQ Khan, so he kind of worked together to get some of these programs set up. Unfortunately, Libya had the technical documents and some of the parts about how to build an enrichment facility, but they didn't have the full expansive human capital you needed to run a large-scale enrichment facility. It didn't really go anywhere. So the Libyan model, which we hear a lot in the news today, you know, which I think is a fun connection here to Back to the Future, you know, what it refers to is the negotiation with Libya and the United States and the United Kingdom to dismantle the Libyan nuclear weapons program as well as its chemical weapons program in exchange for economic aid, security benefits potentially. Some of those things would be worked out so that the Libyans would no longer have a nuclear program. This all started because in October 2003, there was a raided shipment by U.S. intelligence agencies. They found and seized a consignment of centrifuge-related parts bound for Libya. Uh, that's when the Libyan program and their aspirations really came out into the open. So in exchange for international aid, Qaddafi agreed to dismantle his program and ship all of the enrichment facility parts to the United States. You mentioned Kevin uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. All of the enrichment facility parts were shipped to Oak Ridge, and they were assembled. So in January 2004, U.S. military transport planes carried about 55,000 pounds of documents and equipment over to Oak Ridge from from the Libyans. Libya was praised by the international community as, you know, the ideal model for how you give up your nuclear weapons if you get in exchange for international aid. Uh, the Arab world was not too happy with Qaddafi, but Qaddafi said, look, I get economic benefits and all this great stuff. But it only took a couple of years for Qaddafi to maybe feel like he was getting a raw deal. He didn't really get a lot of economic benefits. And then it wasn't until 2011 where the United States and NATO uh, provided air support to rebels on the ground in Libya to overthrow Qaddafi, which resulted in a very, very gruesome death for him involving being found in like a drainage ditch, dragged, shot, uh, a bayonet being placed somewhere very unpleasant on his person, and he was eventually killed while he was trying to prepare a major attack on a, a civilian population center in Libya. So the Libyan model now is often referred to by people like North Korea and Iran as this is what happens when you give up your WMD programs. The West comes in and destroys you. So when John Bolton comes out and says, the Libyan model is what we want to apply to North Korea, what North Korea says is, yeah, no, that's why we have the bombs, is to prevent something like that from happening. Very fascinating, I think, in, in, in the idea of, of Libya being the villains here. In the original script to Back to the Future, the original bad guys were the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the FBI that were tracking the stolen plutonium that Doc Brown stole from the San Onofre nuclear power plant. Uh, which closed in 2013. So those those were the original bad guys and not the Libyans. Very different than the Libyans, I would say. Right, Kevin? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so let's wrap up the podcast here with our parking lot movie discussion. I have a, a deep thought about the Back to the Future timeline, and I want to get your reactions to it. It's a little dark. Let's go. I was wondering when I saw it recently, what would Marty's life be like in his new 1985 timeline? And what, what, what did they think of him? Because... You know, every memory that he has, because now in this new timeline, his memory is of how his parents were lame and how his parents uh, raised him in a particular way and his brother and sister were kind of lame. And the whole world that he's was raised in is now different than the world that he's find himself into now, right? His parents are super cool. His brother and sister are very different. Every memory that they had as a child growing up together is completely different. So his entire 17 years before this point is should be radically different because of how different his parents, because of the early, you know, how they how they met is different and that apparently shapes everything except the fact that they live in the same house and had the same number of kids in the same order, all that kind of stuff. And, but he must pretend to, to believe this false history because otherwise he'll betray Doc Brown and people will realize something's off about him. His mother, his sister, everybody, Biff even, are fundamentally different. But we're to believe that Marty, like, is the only one who is unchanged from the timeline changes, he would have been raised differently, would have had a different outlook on life. So I wonder why maybe this has affected 
what we envision Marty in 2015 when we go to the future. He's very depressed. He's sitting at home. He's trying to play the guitar. We're told it was because he had a car accident that ruined his music career. But I really think it's mostly because Marty's post-1985 life is one long crippling existential crisis. Get that? That is a series of deep questions, Tim. Um, I, I guess one thing that I would say would be that Marty kind of represents the somewhat strong-willed and willing to stand up for himself sort of character that mm-hmm. I think George McFly ultimately ended up becoming. So maybe where Marty couldn't really relate to his parents so much in the original timeline, the pre-time travel timeline, maybe not knowing his parents in the new reality is less of an issue when just their character, their demeanor, their ability to be not just shells of people Mm -hmm. that just are indifferent and beaten down, you know, that Marty can relate more to these new parents than he could to his old parents. So, But imagine imagine your parents, right, all of a sudden being radically different. And yeah, they're cooler now, but they're still not true. And you know for a fact that everything you've experienced the last 16, 17 years of your life to this world, you have to pretend that that's not true. Yeah, that would be tough to play along with. I mean, because assuming that his parents were go from being the, oh, we didn't do anything with our lives, or, I mean, aside from have children and raise them and everything, but, Mm -hmm. you know, from, again, the people that Marty couldn't really relate to and surprised to learn that his mother was such a... when she was (laughs) uh, in high school. But, um, yeah, it would be... hard to then kind of try to mentally fill in the gaps of like okay well if in this new life well how would my parents have raised me what sort of things would he would we have done what sort of family trips would we have gone on and you know he would have to start investigating some of that stuff right yeah you have to kind of turn to his parents and be like hey tell me about those trips that we went on right well i mean he carried around a picture of his brother and sister in him so perhaps there are some photo albums that they can go through so i mean you know recognizing that this still was a movie made 30 years more than 30 years ago now Mm -hmm. that that medium still existed and you know maybe he's got something that he can work with but um that would that would be different to just wake up one day and uh where everything you know is not Mm -hmm how it was as you knew it so it, it definitely seems like you know we know rick and morty right at the the show that was inspired a, a bit by by the relationship between doc and, and marty uh in in this documentary that we mentioned uh, back in time you know the justin Rowland when he created rick and morty it was his way of kind of trying to break away from uh other people telling him what to do with his creative talent and he took a something he really liked, Back to the Future, and kind of made it perverted a little bit in a weird way and just took him to their logical extreme. So I think the very idea of Marty having to readjust to this new identity crisis of what he needs to believe versus what he thinks is real is could just be a plot of Rick and Morty at some point. I'm sure it was Yeah. at some point. I don't know. I think it's kind of interesting. I wouldn't mind if you want to mention one or two of your favorite scenes from the trilogy because we only, only really talked about Back to the Future 1. Um, one of, for me, for example, is the end of Back to the Future 2. It's the guy from Western Union comes by oh, yeah. in the rain, and he looks like he's pulling out a gun, and it's a, a letter, and it's because it was written in 1980, 1885, 1885. Right? Is your name Marty McFly? Yeah? I've got something for you. A letter. A letter for me? That's impossible. Who the hell are you? Western Union. I love that scene. That whole scene is one of my favorite things that's stuck in my memory from Back to the Future 2. Yeah, that's... I mean, because, yeah, think about it. Doc had to have the foresight to... I, I'm assuming Western Union... Yeah, so Western Union must have already existed, but to give them a letter and be all like, don't open this for 70 years or don't, or give it to somebody at this random location, Mm -hmm. you know, 70 years from now. Which parallels the letter that Doc got from Marty. Yeah, except uh, Marty did not rip this one up. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, that's that's a good one. I I don't know. I I always think it's fun and kind of completely pointless every time Doc makes these uh, these scale or these, <laughs> these models. Sorry, not to scale. Yeah. And not painted and. Of course, that's more, you know, Back to the Future, the first Back to the Future movie and Back to the Future 3, where he's got the little time machine with the, the bullet casings crammed mm-hmm. into the back to make it look like the the fins on the back of the DeLorean and everything. So uh, it's, yeah, th- those were always fun to me. Um, I think that it was really uh, interesting whenever they had the interactions with their other selves, mm-hmm. like when Doc in Back to the Future 2 is trying to conceal his identity from himself uh, out on the the street of downtown Hill Valley, you know, while while his 1955 self is setting up the weather experiment, and uh, then 1985 Doc is there, you know, speaking with him and everything. So I I love how they take scenes like that, like when Mar- Marty's playing Johnny Be Good in Back to the Future One, you know, in Back to the Future Two, they turn that whole sequence into like an action scene because. Behind the scenes, it's Marty from later in time trying to stop the bullies from beating up the Marty that's currently playing on stage. Because otherwise then Marty wouldn't be able to get back to 1985, which would then cause his universe to collapse. Sure, it's like the whole parallel storyline uh, in, in Back to the Future 2 that it's seeing Back to the Future 1 from a different perspective, which, I mean... That's kind of a cool thing. It, it's a lot of fun. I can't think of other movies that have done that very well. I know the Harry Potter movies do that. The books with uh, the time changer, time turner, whatever that thing is. Uh, there's those scenes where you can see, oh, this happened because of people from the future in- influencing this time. I don't know. I, those are kind of fun stuff. I also really like how Marty and Doc switch their euphemisms and exp- explanations. Oh, yeah. How Marty starts saying Great Scott and Doc Brown starts saying Heavy. It's heavy. It's a fun little relationship twist when you hang out with people long enough. They start to, uh, they you know take on the forms of the other person. I, that's kind of a cool character development moment. Great Scott! I know this is heavy. Yeah, and I'm, I I do appreciate uh, Back to the Future two and three were originally all kind of shot in one go. It was originally going to be one movie, but then it became too much, and so they expanded it into two separate movies, which I appreciate because there's a lot to cover in both of them that you know would have been way too much to cover in just one movie. I kind of like Back to the Future 3. When, when we watched the trilogy movies, I kind of took a tiny little bit of a nap during Back to the Future 2 because <laughs> I've seen that movie so many times that I really was kind of wanting to be awake for Back to the Future 3. And um, people kind of rat on it a little bit, but I really like Back to the Future 3. I enjoy them all, yeah. So I'm happy that uh, we were able to talk about it now based on our experiences. We saw it separately and then together. Uh, so let's let's wrap up here by doing our rating system. You know, we always like to have a consistent one to five rating so that we can compare it across all whatever new content we're talking about. Well, we like to tailor it because if we're going to get super critical about the content, we want to get super critical about the rating too. Uh, So let's do 1.5 gigawatts. One gigawatt is almost enough to travel through time, but five gigawatts will get you traveling through time and style, which is the way you want to do it. Uh, So what would you give this out of one to five gigawatts? I mean, this is, to me, uh, a solid five gigawatts. Hmm. It is so deeply ingrained in, in my cultural upbringing, and, uh, you know, it's I can watch it here all these years later, and still, I mean, even when I nitpick at little things, mm-hmm. uh, I, I still always appreciate it and, you know, always have fun watching it, so it just does it for me, so. Well, I'm going to give it five, too. It, you know, it's a, to me, it, because of... Uh, all the other great parts about the movie, even as a, uh, a watching this movie with the lens of wanting to be critical, super critical even, about the new content, yeah, that stuff doesn't make a lot of sense, but it doesn't matter. It's not that kind of movie, and it fits very well. I love the music. I love the, the characters. Uh, I love thinking about now I'm going to watch Back to the Future 2 and 3 because I, I need to because if <laughs> I want to see how the story plays out and see if there's any new things there. Uh, Back to the Future 1, is a, to me, is a perfect movie. There aren't a lot of these movies that I think are just perfect films. Jaws, I think we gave a 5 to. Terminator 2, I gave a 5 to. Good one. There aren't a lot of movies like that for me that are just perfect. Absolutely. So let's conclude with stuff to recommend. Because normally we say, don't watch this, watch this other stuff instead. 
because a lot of the Nuke movies we watch are not very good. But this is a great movie. So if you really enjoy this, maybe you'll like some of the other things. One is the Back in Time documentary, which we both talked about watching. And there's some cool behind-the-scenes stuff, historical uh, inspirations. Um, it's on Netflix right now, so you can be able to get that for free. I would also recommend a book called Unclear Physics, Why Iraq and Libya Failed to Build Nuclear Weapons from 2016 by Melfred Brought Hedgehammer. She's a scholar who looks at these issues very closely, and she ultimately blames the lack of state capacity within those countries to do a nuclear program, but also how authoritarian governments sometimes have trouble building the scientific capability to build a nuclear program, which is interesting because that's different than North Korea, who is being able to figure it out with a lot of outside help, but you know, largely they've been able to figure out stuff indigenously now. So I, I would read that book now to kind of get a sense of you know, why Libya needed to turn to a Doc Brown-like person to help with their nuclear program. I would also recommend a book called A Matter of Time, The Unauthorized Back to the Future Lexicon from 2012 by Richard Hanley, who Bob Gale, the screenwriter, uh, considers the authority on all things Back to the Future. He runs a website. He has this great book on all the little tiny details that we talked about. He has a whole chapter on, say, like, here's how the flux capacitor works. It doesn't answer any of my new questions, but it's a fun read uh, if you can get access to this particular book. Uh, so that's what I've got to recommend. Kevin, what do you got? Learn more about the car. The DeLorean is as much of a pivotal character in the Back to the Future series as Marty and Doc Brown are. So it's really interesting to read about or or hear about the uh, the process of how John Z. DeLorean, muscle car aficionado and creator, fell from grace in uh, cocaine sting operations. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's a pretty wild ride. So uh, DeLorean, uh, the documentary, 1981, which is on YouTube, would be a good place to check out, uh, or a good video to check out. And also, uh, for those of you who enjoy video games, uh, check out the Back to the Future game by Telltale Games. Um, It creates new storyline outside of the trilogy uh, that, uh, you know, works well and combines in some cases with uh, all three movies. It's just a great game made by some proper nerds, and the guy that they got <laughs> to uh, do the voice of Marty McFly, it's, good. Was, you know, it's spot on. I mean, it's it's not Michael J. Fox, but holy crap, you would never tell. <laughs> and I think Christopher Lloyd actually did the voice of Doc Brown in that as well. So it's it's a great game, a great series of games, a bunch of chapters. So uh, well, I know a lot of people have been talking about a Back to the Future 4, yeah. And Bob Gale at various points and Robert Zemeckis is like, no, nah, I don't I think we're done with the story. But people keep asking for it. The similar thing happened for a long time with Ghostbusters. You know, when was Ghostbusters 3 going to come out? And eventually there was a video game uh, for the PlayStation and Xbox, which was pretty good. I really liked it. It was essentially Ghostbusters 3. You got to play as one of the characters. Uh, and this was before the new rebooted Ghostbusters uh, came out, so I, I'm glad to, to know that the Telltale game is pretty good too for Back to the Future. Because hopefully that's it. I don't really need to see another Back to the Future movie. Yeah, I think we're okay. Preserve the glorious past. I mean, some things need not be brought back, but only time will tell. Uh, well, thanks for taking the time here to be on the podcast, Kevin. Coming back, I think you redeemed yourself from your nuclear war card game days. I survived the entire episode. <laughs> Uh, so thanks very much uh, for coming on. Hopefully we'll get you on again in the future. People, I know people will want to have you back. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Super Critical Podcast. If you have any suggestions for future episodes or you want us to tell us what we got wrong, uh, either nuke-wise or you know time travel rules-wise, uh, let us know. A couple ways you can contact the show. Facebook.com slash supercriticalpodcast. We're on Twitter at Nuclear Podcast and email supercriticalpodcast at gmail.com. If you've enjoyed the program, hey, we would appreciate it if you would go on iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a five-star review. It really helps us grow the show. And maybe you can let us know some of your favorite moments or what kind of topics you want us to cover in the future. Uh, and then we'll be able to use that and uh, help to determine what we should do next on the show. So until next time, this has been Tim Westmeyer and Kevin. And remember, if it's pop culture and radioactive, we are bound to get super critical about it. Have a good one.
Cue the music. Sorry, I have to pay the copyright on that. So Damn, that I don't have the money. Sorry, Jen. I'm going to have to sell the house because Kevin wants to play this song. I'm sorry. I love that song so much.